Welcome to our latest webinar and thank you for joining us. I hope you're all well and staying safe. My name is Phil Underwood. I'm the engagement manager here at the Society for the Environment. You don't need to know a huge amount about me. I'm going to be handing over to our expert speakers very shortly. But for those who are watching this webinar as a recording, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at any time using the details on your screen. So very quickly, you're watching a Society for the Environment webinar. We hold the two professional registers for environmental professionals. That's the Chartered Environmentalist or CM Register and the Registered Environmental Technician or RM Tech Register. The Society operates as an umbrella organisation currently made up of 24 professional bodies known as our licensed members. All of these professional bodies hold a licence granted by the Society to award the CM registration to their members. Three of these also offer the RM Tech registration. And those are now highlighted on your screen. To become a CM or an RM Tech, you will need to be a member of and apply via one of these professional bodies. The total number of CMs and RM Techs currently adds up to very nearly 7,500 across the world. If you want to find out more, please visit socenv.org.uk or inquire with the relevant professional body directly. So moving swiftly on, the numerous webinars at SOCENV series are designed to provide perspectives from across the wide knowledge spectrum that is our CM and RM Tech registrant base and the sectors that they cover. This is to increase knowledge transfer opportunities for environmental professionals and interested parties. This webinar is the first of a four part series based around the topic of climate change, a 2020 perspective. Today we are focusing on how nuclear power and materials fit into the climate change challenge. Our first speaker today is Dr. Colin Church, who is the Chief Executive at the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining and a Chartered Environmentalist via the Chartered Institution of Waste Management, that's CIWM. So a huge welcome to Colin. Are you with us? I am. Excellent. Good start. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, to provide your expert insights. In short, uh, Colin will be discussing the importance of materials in meeting our climate change targets. Um, so Colin, if you're all set, it is over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Phil. Uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me along. Just very quickly, a little bit about uh, the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, or IOM3. Um, we're a membership organisation, uh, over 15,000 professional members in materials, minerals and mining. Um, we're a learned society, obviously. Um, and uh, we're obviously a licensed body of the Society of the Environment, Engineering Council and Science Council. The strategic aims of IOM3, first of all, to be the best professional membership body we can be. And secondly, and very relevant to today's webinar, uh, we are here to support professionals in our sectors to be heroes of the transition to a low carbon and resource efficient society and not villains. So why do materials, minerals and mining matter for tackling climate change? Um, I'll go through a number of different reasons why this matters. Um, the first one is to look at uh, the historic perspective, which is to say that the only thing about any kind of resource management that matters for the climate change is uh, avoiding landfill emissions. Uh, historically, that was quite a big issue. When you have uh, biological material in landfill sites, if you don't manage it properly, they decay into methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. But this, as you can see from the graph on the screen at the moment, is a relatively small and falling proportion nowadays of the uh, GHG burden that the UK is responsible for. You can see it's the green batch there and it's dropping uh, significantly. And that's because of two things. First of all, because of reduction of biological material going into landfill in the first place. And secondly, because more of the methane is captured uh, and then burned as a fuel to generate electricity or heat. The second point I wanna make is just how fundamental materials are to many of the things that we think are gonna help us out of this climate crisis. Um, 
I really like this 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 uh, saying: um, if it isn't grown, it's mined and uh, increasingly recycled. And on your screen now, you can see just a few modern day things that people talk about as either part of the solution or uh, part of our modern world, electric vehicles, solar panels, wind turbines, and the ubiquitous smartphone. And what I just wanted to do is give you an indication of the sorts of materials and the quantities of materials that are involved in some of those things. In a smart car, you've got uh, a ton of steel, uh, you've got 80 kilograms of copper, you've got 24 kilograms of lithium on average uh, in the battery and the electrics around it, and so on. So materials really do play a really important part in this. I think it's also worth pointing out that mining as a uh, as a interaction is actually quite a significant part of the uh, debate around and the uh, approach to addressing the sustainable development goals. And this graphic here from various sources tries to show where mining has an impact across those SDGs. And mining, of course, is all about extracting materials. So uh, lightweighting materials is obviously a key part of what we're trying to do around transport. Uh, you can use composites, you can use metals such as aluminium, and you can use plastics. And these are all examples where materials are coming in to reduce the weight of things and therefore make them more fuel efficient. Second area that uh, I wanted to mention about is um, how uh, materials are important in the concept uh, in, in the area of uh, food waste. Uh, if food waste was a single country, it would be in the top five of uh, greenhouse gas emitters. Um, and it's a really big issue across the world. Packaging plays an important role in trying to reduce that uh, waste. There are different kinds of uh, interventions, and then this uh, graphic that I just put up on the right hand side of your screen is a US study looking at the reduction um, potential from different packaging interventions that might be there. But anyway, the existing system uh, already is uh, avoiding food waste. And the classic example that many people will know about is the fact that if you shrink wrap a cucumber in plastic, you extend its shelf life from a couple of days to maybe two weeks, which clearly means that people are able to consume it over a longer period of time, which is reducing the amount of waste uh, carbon and, and water and other things that are embedded in that cucumber. There's a newer area uh, as well where some of these issues are coming through and this is in the area of, of, of what I think used to be called geoengineering but basically here the idea is that um, if you place uh, certain minerals or slag from iron making and so on and so forth uh, finer ground onto agricultural land then they can help scrub uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and reduce the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere at the same time as improving the uh, crop uh, because of their uh, fertilizing potential. Um, there's work now going on as to whether this makes sense or not because of then the uh, materials that are, are created, the carbonates tend to run off into the sea eventually. And the key question, of course, one always has to answer in these situations is, is the cure worse than the disease? So what are the impacts of those carbonates? I mean, I've, at first blush, it, you would think it might be quite positive because it would help counteract some of the acidity in the oceans, but work is going on to look at whether in fact that does work or not. And then of course, the, you've got the uh, question about um, using timber to make timber buildings. Um, if you take timber and you burn it, that's short-term carbon, that's biomass, that's not as bad for the uh, CO2 burden as some other forms of combustion energy like coal or gas or whatever. Uh, but on the other hand, if you put it in a building and that building stays up for 150 years, then that's uh, an even better way of sequestering carbon from the atmosphere into other places. So the, the third strand I want to just explore is the fact that if you don't use materials correctly, if you misuse them, then we are going to have unnecessary carbon emissions and therefore using materials properly, the flip side of that of course, uh, will help us reduce uh, carbon emissions. This graphic um, from the IRP just shows some of the emissions that come from uh, a number of materials production uh, and processing uh, activities. These are global numbers. So you can see that, that steel and um, other metals, uh, cements and so on and so forth are significant generators of uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally. Um, and so if you're going to use those materials more efficiently, then you are going to save carbon. And again, another IRP graphic here, looking at the sorts of uh, material efficiency gains that you might be able to get in, in this case in cars. 
And there are a number of other areas where that is true as well, electronics and appliances, food and drink, uh, construction as well, clothing and textiles. And this is some work from Green Alliance and CMAP uh, a couple of years ago, looking at the potential uh, savings of CO2 that you might get from resource efficiency. And I think basically the, the conclusion that people have come to over the last uh, couple of years is that you can't effectively and efficiently meet our net zero targets without resource efficiency strategies. Packaging I've mentioned um, already as being a potential uh, help in avoiding some climate change issues, but it's also potentially if we choose the wrong material or we use it in the wrong way, a, a problem. And you've got a graph here from a recent publication by the Green Alliance looking at the embedded CO2 in packaging consumed in the UK. And you can see from here that aluminium is pretty bad, but of course, the more you uh, recycle aluminium, the better that number becomes. And you also need to recognize that if you compare other environmental impacts, such as uh, water, for example, or, or, or air pollution and so on and so forth, that you would see different uh, uh, relationships between these different materials. Plastic might be more or less be um, uh, uh, problematic than aluminium and, and paper and and so on and so forth. Really, the issue here is if you uh, are using something only once, you're bound to have a more negative impact than if you're able to reuse it. So that is really the, the driving here. We need to be more smart about how we use these things. So clearly, if we're not keeping these materials in economic use for a long period of time, they're falling out of the system, then the carbon that's associated with them is, 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 is wasted and we're replacing those materials. So we're generating more carbon. This is a problem. So keeping them in economic use is a good idea. Here's a, a, a subset of the uh, periodic table, just trying to show you some of the um, uh, elements that uh, might be recycled, primarily metals in this case. And the ones in blue are the ones where there's a, a more or less half or more recycling. And as you can see, that's not very many. And some key ones that you can highlight here, uh, aluminium about 60% globally, iron about 52%, nickel about 68% maybe, zinc 45% uh, or so depending on the numbers you look at. So clearly a lot of scope to do more in those spaces. And packaging, recycling, uh, this is just in Europe, and but you can see that very few countries in Europe are uh, in the high uh, uh, percentages of packaging recycling and if you took that across the globe it would be a substantially lower number as well. So the real um, message that I want to, uh, to, to leave you all with is that materials uh, are fundamental to our uh, struggle to tackle climate change, to mitigate uh, climate change. We must reduce the amount of materials that we use for any given use um, and we must reduce the embedded energy. So less energy per ton uh, and less tons per application. We must reuse those items and materials more. The example I like to give to people is, if you think about how much energy is involved in taking iron ore and turning it through smelting and forging and whatever else into a steel carbonate, you compare that to the energy necessary if you take an existing steel carbonate, you rip it off the car, you melt it down and you make it into a new steel bonnet, that's going to be substantially less energy. But of course, if you are able just to um, unbolt it from the original car and bolt it onto a new car, there's even less energy still. So reuse of materials and reuse of items can be a real uh, important part of uh, reducing CO2 emissions. And recycling, of course, at end of life to keep them uh, going round to avoid those negative impacts that can come uh, when we have to get new materials out of the ground. Reduce the amounts, reduce the embedded energy, reuse items and materials more, recycle more materials at end of life, and the end result will be a reduction in CO2 emissions. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you very much, Colin. Some extremely interesting stats there. Um, definitely food for thought a lot of people I'd imagine. Next up is Victoria Robinson, a senior consultant at Nuvia and a chartered environmentalist registered by IEMA and that's the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. Victoria will be focusing on innovation in the field of advanced nuclear technologies and their potential for meeting future energy needs and she certainly wins the award for the best webinar talk so far i imagine if anyone wants to challenge this title in future webinars 
feel very free to give it a go. Um, welcome to Victoria. I shall hand over straight to you now. Thank you. Um, so, okay, uh, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Colin for such an interesting presentation and for um, setting such a high bar for me. Um, so hopefully I can deliver. Uh, in today's presentation, I'm going to take you first through just defining what the energy security challenge is. Um, and then we'll look at how we meet our energy needs currently and how the role of uh, nuclear power might feed into that. Then we'll have a look at some of the challenges faced by uh, the nuclear industry and then also some solutions of how those challenges can be overcome. So if we um, just very quickly define what the energy security challenge is, um, and it's really uh, the ability of the UK to ensure a secure energy supply that can also be delivered at a reasonable cost whilst also decarbonising the energy system. So if we take that in mind, uh, what is the problem? Uh, and really, in summary, it's that the global demand for electricity at the minute shows no sign of slowing down whatsoever. Um, if we look at the graph on the right, you can see that even by 2040, the global requirement for electricity just steadily grows. and coal and gas continues to um, meet a substantial chunk of that electricity demand, um, which just isn't sustainable moving forward and being able to meet our net carbon reduction targets. Um, so what is driving this increased demand? Um, there are a few things that really spring to mind, the first one being electric vehicles. The UK government has pledged to stop the sale of all petrol and diesel cars by 2040. Um, and one of the natural ways of making up this shortfall will be um, through electric vehicles. Um, so just to give you some figures, by the end of 2018, 200,000 vehicles were registered in the UK. Uh, this is expected to increase by at least 2.7 million by 2030. And based on that, the national grid anticipates that the increased electricity demand will be in the region of around 11% of the 2050 national electricity demand. Um, and on top of that, there's going to be an additional challenge posed by um, peak time uh, loading uh, with everyone coming home from their commute from work, um, plugging in their cars, that could increase uh, a peak demand by up to 30%. So again, a secure and consistent supply of electricity is really required. A second one is industry. It's continuing to grow, it's continuing to have a, a demand on um, electricity and a good example of that is hydrogen consumption, which has increased threefold since 1975. And then moving on, if we look closer to the home, at our own homes, a lot of people are kind of moving to a smart home where you've got a lot of electrical devices that are um, either constantly being charged or having a consistent draw. Um, with the average household having around 11 smart devices. Um, and finally, the battle of the sexes, if I may say, um, with regard to finding that optimal temperature with more extreme weather events, um, the increased requirement for heating and cooling is likely to grow. And this is going to be exacerbated by um, the UK's clean growth strategy, which requires all new build houses after 2025 to be no longer heated by gas. So again, electricity is going to be kind of meeting that shortfall. Um, but it's not all bad news. Um, if we look at electricity generation for 2019, 54% uh, uh, was met by low carbon energy sources. And 40% of this was by renewables, which is absolutely fantastic. So it's absolutely vital that we continue to grow and develop renewable energy um, as it makes a vitally important contribution to our net zero greenhouse gas emissions. But there are some challenges. For example, consistency, it can be affected seasonally, day and night, or even over a period of several hours. Um, and with more extreme and unpredictable weather events, we're not sure, you know, will this be um, overcome moving forward? As I've alluded to already, will it be able to meet peak demands uh, when the sun isn't shining, when the wind isn't blowing? Um, location, a lot of times uh, renewable energy sources are located many, many miles away from where the uh, electricity is actually needed. So we need a way of either updating and revising our electricity networks or potentially looking at an alternative. 
and then there's energy storage again batteries and things have come a long long way but there's still some improvements that are needed and particularly if we look at what Colin ref was referring to earlier about the mining of heavy metals and rare earth elements and things again it's another challenge that needs to be looked at and nuclear power um, like it or not could be a complementary strategy that helps us achieve that secure and low carbon energy supply moving forward this is just a quick graph just to show you the breakdown of contribution of nuclear globally in the big graph and then nuclear contribution to energy supply in the UK. So it is significant. Um, but there are some challenges. Uh, by no means, um, I'm not suggesting that nuclear is a panacea or something that can answer all of our problems. There are challenges that we do face. Uh, for example, our current nuclear fleet is aging. Uh, we've got 50 nuclear power plants across eight stations and a lot of these are going to be taken out of service from 2025 and whilst we can do plant life extension this cannot occur indefinitely if we're going to meet uh, the required levels of safety and environmental performance uh, public opinion is still uncertain and particularly with incidents such as fukushima people's trust in it providing a safe and secure electricity supply can be questioned um, then there are time scales and costs it's been well publicised recently that the UK's new build programme um, has been creeping in terms of time and cost, and this is exemplified in Flemingville in France, which was originally going to uh, come online in 2012, but has now been postponed to 24, uh, and with an increase in cost of from 3 billion euros to, <coughs> sorry, around 12.4 billion. And finally, there's waste. It is the elephant in the room. We do have a legacy issue here in the UK. Uh, we still don't have a geological disposal facility yet agreed. Um, and any new build programme will inevitably add to that challenge. Um, and just as an interesting aside, the graph you can see now um, shows how much um, low carbon electricity has um, been generated and then how that tails off after nuclear reactors start to come offline. And then the faded red just shows you the shortfall that needs to be met either by uh, renewables themselves or by a nuclear alternative. But there are solutions. Um, the government in the UK certainly remains committed to nuclear new build programmes and has invested millions of pounds into advanced nuclear technologies, uh, fusion reactors. Um, we've got 30 new reactors planned or under construction, including Hinkley Point C. The government's currently looking into uh, improving the generic design assessment process to kind of streamline it, remove some of the red tape, but also continuing to meet environmental and safety performance targets. And we're also looking at a revised funding model, which puts the focus more on getting money to the fleet owners up front so they have to borrow less and reduce costs. And with regard to waste, um, at the risk of grossly oversimplifying, uh, the amount of radioactive waste in the UK isn't actually that large, and we're getting much, much better at managing it. Um, the UK has made, and across the world, we've made massive improvements in being able to characterise waste, treat it and condition it. So we're maximising the amount of waste that can either be recycled or disposed of at a conventional landfill site. In the next 100 years, for example, the UK inventory is expected to be around 1.5 million tonnes of radioactive waste. So that includes everything we have now and everything projected for the next 100 years. And to put that into perspective, the UK generates 5.3 approximately million tonnes of waste every year. And then um, just at the image on the right just is from the Canadian Nuclear Association that if we used nuclear fuel and just that, your entire lifetime waste fuel would fit into a Coke can per person, which is quite impressive. And then just to very quickly look at some alternative solutions to our current new build strategy, and that's advanced nuclear technologies. Uh, these can be divided into two categories. We've got nuclear or advanced modular reactors, which is a kind of next generation technology which utilizes novel cooling systems or novel fuels to increase functionality. Uh, this includes things like molten salt reactors or 
stable salt or um, lead cooled. Um, and another alternative strategy is small modular reactors. These designs are based on conventional nuclear power stations, but on a much, much smaller scale. They're simple modular systems that are built using existing techniques and technologies off site. And then the modules are brought to site uh, either by road rail or sea. Mm. And um, the electricity output is much, much smaller. Uh, they have a much reduced cooling requirement and a much better safety performance as they rely on a really robust combination of passive and active safety systems. So this is an example um, of the UK's leading design from Rolls-Royce, the UK SMR. It's based on a pressurised water reactor type design, um, which uses light or normal water as a coolant. It's tried and tested, it uses industry standard fuel, and it, it's much simpler in design, but it does use that kind of combination of active, passive and redundant safety systems. So you've got diversity in defence and depth, which certainly improves safety and environmental performance. Um, due to the modularity of the design, um, the construction time is expected to be about 500 days, which is much, much shorter than the eight to 10 years you can normally expect for a conventional nuclear power plant. And it has a 60 year operational life, uh, which could be extended if required and compared to the operational life of wind turbines and things, it's actually quite good. Um, and because it is built with much more of the final design finished, operational costs are much, much lower. So yes, it does offer a lot of advantages. Being smaller and modular uh, with a lower power outlay, outlay um, it's much better at load following. So if renewables are capable of meeting current energy demands, the small modular reactors can be much more either ramped down or diverted to other uses, such as industrial heat production, or um, even the generation of other useful byproducts such as hydrogen or desalination plants. And if you're generating hydrogen, you've actually effectively got a really good mechanism for energy storage. Uh, it's modular, it's easier to finance, and you start to get economy of scale if you can build modules much, much on a much larger scale. Um, and then you can do incremental uh, implementation, which means you can start to um, phase in each reactor module, which means you've got a more consistent um, employment of a technical skill space. You can reduce the period of outage because you can time them separately. So again, you're securing the energy supply in the long term. And because it's easier to locate, it can be where energy is needed. Um, for example, in Canada, they're starting to look into using small modular reactors in very remote areas with the aim of replacing the existing diesel generators with small modular reactors as a much cleaner way of uh, bringing elect electricity to these rural communities. And it promotes innovation. So in conclusion, uh, you're almost free to go. But other than that, um, I thought it's really worth highlighting again that renewable energy is definitely the way to go. And the UK and around the globe are making really positive um, steps forward into having this lead our low carbon economy. However, there are still some challenges faced by renewables, which may mean it struggles to meet the growing demands placed on the energy system and really the use of fossil fuels just isn't an option anymore and potentially once we start to develop all these new innovative solutions nuclear power may well be um, an alternative and complementary strategy so i uh, thank you very much for listening thank you very much victoria yeah, fantastic. Uh, and another huge thank you to Colin as well for, for his presentation before Victoria's. Um, for everyone watching, uh, please stick around. It's now the question and answer time. And I've seen some questions come in, which look very interesting. So I would certainly advise sticking around. If you haven't already done so, now is the time to ask a question to both Colin and Victoria using that Q&A function in your toolbar. If you could stick to the Q&A function, that'd be great rather than the chat. Otherwise, I'll get very confused. Um, we will do our best to finish before uh, one o'clock. Um, but our two speakers today have been very efficient. So we have quite a bit of time. 
Um, now, to start off with, whilst you're asking questions, we, if you remember, we asked, uh, there was an option to ask questions when you registered for this webinar. So we're just gonna run through a few of those first. So we'll dive straight in. Uh, this one is uh, aimed towards Victoria, uh, which is a challenging one to begin with, sorry. Um, the question is, isn't nuclear the, the 1970 answer to climate change, not the 2020 answer? Um, How would you like to tackle that one? <laughs> it's, it's a good question. Um, I suppose that could be true if you take a 1970s approach when around 93% of um, energy was produced by fossil fuels and less than 5% by nuclear. Um, but things have progressed a lot since then. Um, and back in the 1970s, there was you know, this hope that nuclear would be the panacea and would be the way forward. But um, we've learned from our mistakes and we know the, the shortfalls of nuclear, but also its benefits. And I think the way we have chosen to apply it now and how we're looking to apply it moving forward is very, very different. So it's not this kind of dominating energy supply, but something that is complementary to renewables and uses innovation and learning from experience, which to me is a much more 2020 uh, way forward and approach. Okay, excellent stuff. Um, the next question I have here is, is, isn't quite, isn't specific to either of your talks really, but maybe I'll throw it to, to Colin if that's okay. Um, and I don't think we really know the answer yet maybe, but. What is the effect of lockdown due to COVID-19 on climate? Is that something an unknown at the moment? Um, there's some early uh, evidence that suggests it's reduced CO2 emissions from certain sources. Hmm. So uh, certainly from uh, air traffic, obviously, um, and uh, vehicle traffic uh, in general. Um, it's probably pushed up people's uh, consumption of electricity at home. You know, we're all... Uh, running our devices, but how that will compare to what they would have used had they've been in the office is not yet clear. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's too early to be absolutely certain in terms of the uh, immediate impacts on CO2 emissions, but it looks like there will be a short-term dip. Um, the expectation is we'll have the lowest emissions globally uh, this year for, for quite some time. I think the more interesting question is, you know, what, what difference will this make in a, in a long-term world? Mm. And I think there's some really interesting signs coming out. So in my own organisation, for example, we've been talking for a little while now about moving some of our activities uh, to an online basis rather than face to face. And to be frank, there's been a degree of resistance to that um, because we've had to do that uh, as part of the, the lockdown. I think a lot of that resistance has now dissipated because people have experienced it and find that actually doing a professional review interview uh, over video does work, can work. So I think there will be activities that um, traditionally were face to face that we're much more comfortable doing uh, remotely now going forward. And again, if you're having to travel a long way to do something versus um, the small amount of electricity you might use to run your laptop, uh, that's going to have potential carbon impacts. And there are lots of others as well. Um, but I think uh, a lot of this is, as with all of these societal impacts from COVID-19, up in the air, we don't just know yet. No, we shall see what happens to an extent, and obviously we'll, uh, the various, well, we'll, we'll try and uh, shape that into something that's more positive for the future as well, I think. So um, the Society for Environment is looking into that as well, I believe. Uh, I think Colin is part of the subsection of our board that is looking into what we're going to do about it in terms of the new normal, I guess, uh, going forward. So time will tell on that one. This one is a, another nuclear-based one. It is, it is a, another kind of historical one. Um, so often the nuclear industry is judged by its history, uh, written off as part of the low carbon solution. Hydrogen fuel is a huge potential disruptor to improve the environmental impact of transport. Should we therefore compare this technology to the Hindenburg or, and stop potential mobile bombs roaming our streets? Is that something you'd like to come in on, Victoria? Um, that's, again, another interesting question. <laughs> um, 
again, it's kind of, uh, as you say, kind of learning from past mistakes and certainly nuclear has made mistakes and some things have not been managed as well as they should have. Um, so I think the question is really, um, has nuclear learned from its past experiences and is it getting better in meeting um, you know, modern standards of safety and environmental performance. And if it hasn't, should we be questioning other things? You could look at even the chemical industry in Bhopal and should we be using hazardous substances because the people of Bhopal have been, are still living with the fallout from that decades later or with hydrogen because it has reacted terribly um, and there have been disasters with hydrogen. Should we stop? hydrogen research and so on. Um, and I think with all of these things, um, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, and I believe that whilst well, nuclear today um, operates on a much, much higher standard, um, much more rigorous safety and environmental uh, standards are expected today. Um, and these all, even for following on from Fukushima, UK and global policy has changed, making it a much more viable solution. So I think you could compare them in some ways because all of these things have improved and the uh, regulators continue to ensure that very high standards are uh, being met. Okay, thank you very much for that one. So next question is, now we're moving on to questions that are coming live throughout the webinar. Um, while the IEA predicts ongoing consumption of energy, others are predicting that efficiency will also increase. So the curve will start to drop around 2040. What do we do with excess power that we could create with limited space? I think that goes back to um, what I was saying. I mean, at the minute, there are occasionally risks of blackouts when uh, renewables generate too much electricity and the grid cannot cope. Um, but there is a potential with excess energy, um, as I mentioned in the presentation earlier, to have um, co-generation projects. Um, so you can use the heat generated as part of an industrial heat source or for heating homes or water, um, or you can divert that electricity um, into a specific factory or process. For example, generating hydrogen, which can be through electrolys electrolysis quite energy intense or um, desalination of water. So rather than just losing and wasting that energy, whether that's from renewables or nuclear or whatever, you can divert it to generate very useful and um, potential energy storage byproducts. Okay. Um, now let's go for quite a different question here. Uh, maybe Colin might be able to help with this one. Other than recycling, what actions can we do from our home that will help make a difference? I assume that's the climate change in general. Um, so obviously, yes, recycling is one. Um, looking just generally at all of your energy use, you know, are you, um, when you replace uh, uh, a light bulb, what are you moving to? Are you moving to a low energy, ideally LED light bulb, for example? Um, are you uh, adjusting your thermostat uh, to make sure that you're heating the house only when you need to and only to the degree you need to? Um, is it better to stick a jumper on than it is to crank the thermostat up to 23, that sort of issue? Um, uh, looking at uh, your modes of transport, is it possible to use uh, public transport rather than your private vehicle if you have to use a private vehicle? Uh, is it economically and practically possible to use an electric vehicle or a hybrid? Um, do you have to fly? Uh, could you uh, either not make the trip um, and do it virtually or find another way of getting to the destination that you need to get to? I'm not quite suggesting we go or Greta Thunberg and sail across the Atlantic, but I think you know there are questions about uh, whether we should be taking those uh, short distance in particular flights um, that we could otherwise do so. Uh, and uh, I mentioned the importance of, of, of food waste. In the developed world, uh, the greater proportion of food waste comes from the home. So uh, being more careful about uh, the, the food uh, that you buy and, and wasting less of it 
um, would also be a, a big contribution. So there's just a few thoughts, and I'm sure lots of other people on this call probably have lots of other ideas as well. With a quick, with a quick Google search, there are quite a few ideas out there that can that can help. Certainly, um, not that Google's always trustworthy, but there's there's lots of options out there anyway. Um, and this one's aimed towards Colin as well. Um, is it agreed that biomass and burning of wood derivatives is bad for the climate and CO2? Nope. Simple answer. Um, okay. So <laughs> people... <laughs> People tend to differentiate between uh, what's called short-term carbon and long-term carbon. Long-term carbon is um, carbon that's been uh, put into the ground through some sort of long geological process, and that then turns into coal or oil or natural gas. Uh, short-term car carbon, and short in this case is a few hundred years, is carbon that's cycling through the system. When wood grows, it absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere, when it either rots or you burn it, it releases that into the atmosphere, um, but it's on a churning basis. So from a CO2 perspective, burning biomass is much better than burning coal or gas or oil. Um, there are uh, tweaks on that. So you have the question of other forms of um, air quality and air pollution, where burning wood, particularly if it's damp uh, or in an, a badly designed um, uh, appliance can create issues around particulate pollution which is quite uh, harmful in local areas um so you know it's, it's not an absolute burning biomass is always a good thing but burning biomass properly is uh, better than burning coal gas or oil um the issue then is where you're getting it from and whether you could do something better with where you're getting it from like produce food or as i mentioned earlier you know if I have the choice between burning coal and burning wood, it should be better to burn wood from CO2 perspective, but even better still would be to use that wood to build a house that stays for 150 years. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Um, now this next question is about vehicles and Colin mentioned vehicles in his presentation and, and so did Victoria to be fair. Um, so wood keeping cars and trucks uh, long, or keep, keep them running longer uh, to have a longer life. Uh, do, would that cut down on total emissions? Um, they say they're a bit of a petrol head. Um, but so essentially, I think the question might be if you were to bring about, uh, introduce lots of low carbon vehicles, um, would it be better to just keep the current stock going? Based bear in mind the carbon that's involved in making new vehicles. Who would like to have a go at that? So I think um, this is where you get into uh, the complex area of life cycle analysis, mm. trying to work out the environmental impacts of, of something uh, all the way through its um, manufacture uh, use and, and, and end of life. Um, the data that I've seen suggests that for an internal combustion engine, by far and away the greatest amount of carbon is associated with its in-use phase. Um, so... Uh, that suggests that beyond a certain age of vehicle, uh, it's probably better to have it uh, appropriately recycled, which reduces the amount of waste um, and waste CO2. Um, uh, and uh, if you, uh, sorry, to replace that um, uh, at an appropriate point for a more efficient and ideally uh, hybrid or electric vehicle, if, you, if that works, um, is probably the sensible Thing to do that's what the current uh, information would suggest but it is that 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 thing about you know working it through all the way through the the, the analysis uh, of of where the big use and big um, production costs are right so more of a complex one that one when you dig into it a bit further i think okay we're going to go back to nuclear um when nuclear fusion is finally achieved how quickly could it be utilised as a commercial power generator and replace the current, in inverted commas, dirty fusion systems? I don't know much about that. But uh, do you have sorry. an answer to that, Victoria? Uh, sorry, was that regarding fission or fusion? Fusion. I just say, well, um, it says when, when nuclear fusion is finally achieved, how quickly could it be utilised as a commercial power generator and replace the current dirty fission systems? I couldn't give you a solid answer for that. Um, there are 
massive steps being made currently um, in Cadarache in France, um, building a kind of test fusion reactor. Um, and also we've got a lot of work currently going on in the UK. Um, I think we're probably still several decades away from it being a commercial source of electricity, but um, we're certainly starting to get to a stage now where um, the amount of energy being generated is now exceeding the input energy. Um, but it's certainly a very much watch this space, although there are um, new emerging technologies uh, which are based on um, a species of shrimp which um, cause a kind of sonic boom to knock out their prey and there's a new form of fusion technology based on this shrimp that is currently being developed by um, a team at Oxford University which uh, it's kind of a plasma initiated uh, fusion technology which again I, it will take several years to get to a commercially um, electricity generating level but watch this space certainly okay that's a question and an answer that's gone straight over my head i must admit <laughs> but an interesting one nonetheless um, uh, this one's uh, more based towards colin again it's about materials um basically how do we stop um plastic from harming animals um so they're saying that the increasing it, increasingly recycled rates of stuff uh, won't stop it being littered. Should the packaging be redesigned so it isn't harmful when littered? So I think um, you have to start first of all with uh, thinking about the practicalities and the and, 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 and the design of the of the packaging. Um, all forms of single use packaging and indeed single use other things have negative issues associated with them whether it's plastic or metal or paper or whatever else because it's only used once uh, and so you're putting whatever embedded carbon into it and you're then creating whatever environmental hazard at the end of its life uh, for only one single use so we should definitely be looking at where practical having uh, multi-use packaging um, reusable coffee cups is the one that, of course, uh, it was all the rage before COVID-19 made us all stay at home and drink it out of China. Oh, look, that's reusable too. Um, but, you know, designing it in the first place to be multi-use wherever possible, that's a an important element. If it has to be single use, then making sure that, first of all, it's designed in a way that makes it easy to recycle, that's important. Secondly, uh, enabling people to uh, do the right thing with it. So having the, a former minister of mine used to say, bin infrastructure. So the, the, the bins and the, and the sorting and the collection points suitably distributed so that it's much easier for people to put it in the right place than perhaps in some places it is now. And then I think a really strong demand for the material that comes out at the end of that, that has a real value, because then people are going to want to do more with it. One of the... Um, interesting examples that people use is coca-cola's bottles so if you go back into um the uh, sort of 20 30 years ago and you went to africa or asia or south america or whatever else um coke was sold in those old uh, glass bottles and there was effectively a deposit on it and they would i uh, would make their way back to coca-cola be reused or indeed people would use them locally um and uh, there was a almost a circular economy in in a sense around those um, bottles because they had a value. Replace them with plastic bottles into, into so, um, countries where there is no uh, or very little structured uh, waste management and recycling um, and where they are perceived to have very low value and all of a sudden you've got a massive littering problem. So if you can find a way then to say that that plastic bottle has a real value then people will take more care of it and it will get back into the hands of those people who can do something with it. So design it to be not single use if possible. If it is single use, make it very recyclable, make it really easy for people to do the right thing mm -hmm. and then real, create real value around the material itself so it comes back. I don't think that um, compostable plastics in the short term are a sensible solution um, because they create all sorts of problems that come along and I can go on at length about that if anybody really wants me to. Okay, if anyone wants that, 
um, then uh, if you wanted to get in touch with me, then we could send some questions to Colin. We'll see. Um, probably the last question for Victoria. Um, with the potential increase in demand for electricity due to electric vehicles, um, is nuclear power a, able to fill the gap where the increase in electricity is required? And how long will it take for that to be able to happen? Um, based on our current projections for um, nuclear new build, I think that it would certainly be capable of filling that gap by the time um, the use of electric vehicles hits its peak at around 2045, 2050. Um, I know that there are uh, particularly in places like Canada where the use of modular reactors um, seems to be moving at a faster rate. Uh, we can certainly learn from what they do moving forward, but um, certainly, um, and particularly if you have small modular reactors which are located at a community level, they might be better able um, to meet these peak demands locally um, moving forward. So yes, I think it is a viable solution. Okay, interesting stuff. There are many other questions, but we haven't got time to go through them now. So um, once again, thank you very, very much to Colin and Victoria for spending some time with us today. Um, some two very interesting uh, presentations and, and very interesting answers to some of those questions as well. So thank you very much for that. Uh, that isn't quite the end of the webinar. Um, we have some opportunities that may well be of interest to you. So if you hang on for just a moment. Next up is our um, next webinar series. Uh, which is a biodiversity special because of World Environment Day. Uh, each year, the Society for the Environment, uh, we celebrate World Environment Day by sharing environmental good practice across sectors, uh, inspiring action and showcasing achievements with uh, some awards and lectures. Uh, this for format clearly uh, needed to be adapted for this year, uh, which results in a series of excellent um, expert-led webinars that we're we'll running uh, as well as a podcast thrown in there for good measure um, so biodiversity is the umbrella topic um, for world environment which is set by uh, the uh, un environment each year um, alongside the special webinar series we're also developing a biodiversity toolkit for to give kids the general public uh, environmental professionals and so on ideas to help biodiversity locally and globally uh, the hub will be launched very soon and we would love to you to get involved if possible uh, so please keep an eye out for comms relating to that soon um later this year our next webinar series is based around the topic of natural capital. If you are a chartered environmentalist or registered environmental technician and you have a project that you would like to showcase uh, and allow other environmental professionals to learn from or if you have some top tips that other sectors should consider during their work or guidance on how you have implemented relevant standards and frameworks then please get in touch. We would love you to be involved in the future webinar series. If you're interested to hear more about becoming a chartered environmentalist or RM Tech, uh, if you take a look at our How to Become and Why Become Recorded webinar series on our website, um, your, sorry, the recordings are on our website, they're also on our YouTube channel. Um, and you'll also find our latest uh, series on there, which is a sustainable built environment. And they will be joined by um, the recording of this webinar very shortly. This is the final slide. So uh, if you wanted to hear more about becoming a CM of an RF tech, again, uh, check out our website. Uh, that will have all the information on there and will guide you through the, the process, uh, which is through our licensed members. So that's about it from us today. Uh, thank you for listening and taking part. Um, if you are watching on YouTube as a recording, uh, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell to gain notifications of new videos and tap the big thumbs up the like button if you can, that'd be great. If you're watching on our website, please link, uh, click on the YouTube button and head to those buttons there. Um, thank you very much to our special guests today, which is Victoria and Colin, two fantastic talks. And we shall see you at the next webinar, which is next week, 
where we'll be talking all things environmental impact assessment and how that links to climate change. So for now, thank you for watching and stay safe. Goodbye.